they committed no crimes. Yet they were imprisoned by the U.S. government. Their arrests and incarceration were motivated by racism, fear, and the failure of political leadership. These are the untold stories of Oahu. In 1885, larger numbers of Japanese began to immigrate to Hawaii. Many came to work the sugar plantations. Others came as ministers and teachers. All who came were in search of a better life. My father's name was Matsujiro Otani. He felt that the, there wasn't much future for him on the island where he was, which is a tiny little island in the uh, Kyushu. So, just on the spur of the moment, he just took off and came to Hawaii when he was 16 years old. Uh, in order to make a living, he went out peddling the fish, selling to the different pies. My parents had nine children. I, I was the second son with a fifth child. My father's name was Koichi Ida. He was born, I understand, in Osaka, Japan. He came in when he was 19 years old. His father, that's my grandfather, he started a small business on Mount Akir Street uh, back in 1900. And after um, my father became of age, he took over the store. My dad worked here mostly doing surgeon, he was a physician. The residence was up in Liliha. My grandfather moved there way back in the days of the Hawaiian Kingdom. He was an early arrival in Hawaii. In Honolulu, Matsujiro Otani expanded his business and acquired a fish market. December 7, 1941, my father had bought the, what was called the Ala Market building, and we were supposed to have, he was supposed to have a relatively uh, auspicious opening of the market at that, on that day. For the Issei, or first-generation immigrants and their children, the Nisei, dark clouds soon rolled over their lives as the nation of Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. As the smoke still rose from Pearl Harbor, squads of FBI, military police, and local police started arresting Japanese on the FBI custodial detention list across the territory of Hawaii. December 7th, I was at church in the morning and uh, at the Sunday school as usual. And then we heard all these bombings. And black puffs of smoke. Somehow or other, I got home. And when I got home, the, uh, I was just in time to see the federal authorities arrest my father at gunpoint. That night, of course, uh, the family gathered and we were all sad like a dickens and uh, not knowing what to do. There were a bunch of men that drove up to the house, six or seven men, and later on I realized the other man in a civilian suit must have been the person that later became Governor Burns. Governor Burns was working at the time as a detective for the Honolulu Police Force. They took both my father and my grandfather away during the daytime. Somehow, with all the commotion, the news had gotten around that my father was going to be taken soon after. And so 
my father was all prepared and he was uh, dressed in his coat and tie. And they had these uh, gun bayonets, you know, to get you, you you're arrested you know, to come with us and they just grabbed him. Oh, we were all so scared and we didn't know what to do, actually. From then on, my mother was so worried that she had waited by the door and she was waiting for him to come back, but he didn't come back that night. And then we all cried. For several years prior to World War II, the FBI compiled a detailed list of Japanese to arrest and detain in the event of war. The detention list contained Buddhist ministers, Japanese language school teachers, community leaders, and those with ties to the Japanese government. He was very active in the Japanese community. He took my mother and my two brothers to Japan in 1940, and it was uh, to celebrate the emperor's 2,500 years. And that was a significant trip because here he met the emperor. It's, it's really a very silly assumption on the part of the government, the FBI or other government officials felt that because he was in the fishing industry, that he had control of the fishing boats. Victor's father, Dr. Motokazu Mori, and his wife, Ishiko Mori, were suspected of passing coded messages to a Japanese newspaper on the eve of the Pearl Harbor attack during a phone conversation. In reality, Dr. Mori and his wife were simply answering questions for a Tokyo newspaper interview. Dr. Mori was taken first to the Honolulu police station where he was kept without food or water and interrogated until midnight. He was held in solitary confinement for three days. An arrest squad returned to the Mori residence later that night. Somebody showed up and asked my stepmother to accompany them. And then as they looked around and saw me, they said, you too, come along. Nearly 400 individuals were arrested across the territory of Hawaii in the immediate days that followed Pearl Harbor. Martial law was soon declared in Hawaii. Military control began, and civil liberties and the Constitution were suspended. But then, at night, we heard on the radio, uh, I heard on the radio, that uh, the Territorial Guard were asking for volunteers to serve in, in the service. Uh, when I heard the news that they were accepting volunteers, I, I volunteered for the so-called Territorial Guard. It was a territory, then it was a state. Victor Mori was a high school student when he was jailed at the Honolulu police station. From that time, I didn't see anybody until the 17th. So that would have been 10 days. There was nothing in the cell except the bunk, three meals a day consisting of a hard tag and coffee that was sweetened with sugar. The two men in civilian clothes came up and asked me a few questions like, what was my name? What did I do? Or where did I go to school? And that was about the past. And they said, well, you can go now. Victor Mori's grandfather was released a few days later. Those arrested on Oahu, like Dr. Mori, Koichi Iida, and Matsujiro Otani, were crowded into the U.S. immigration station near downtown Honolulu. They were led around by soldiers with bayonets. Conditions were even harsher at Sand Island. Prisoners lived in tents until barracks were built. The camp would flood during heavy rains. 
they were strip searched and stripped of their dignity. At its peak, Sand Island held more than 450 local Hawaii residents, including those from the neighbor islands. After a stay at Sand Island, many were shipped off to Department of Justice camps on the U.S. mainland. President Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066 in February of 1942. This led to the mass incarceration of all persons of Japanese ancestry from the U.S. West Coast. Hawaii was spared from a mass incarceration. However, selective arrests continued through 1942. Over 1,300 individuals were incarcerated from Oahu. United States Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa had both her maternal and paternal grandparents incarcerated during World War II. Both worked for the Waianae Plantation and were arrested in January of 1942. What I do believe happened is that the both of them were the founders of the Waianae Honganji Mission. And I think that was probably what triggered it. So my Hanabusa grandfather uh, was the one who went to Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was the fisherman for the plantation. He lost his sandpan. He could never go back to fish. Meanwhile, Koichi Iida and other Issei from Hawaii were sent across the mainland United States to various detention facilities. One of the internees from Hawaii, um, Kaetsu Furia, and he talks about the experience of um, undergoing a medical exam on Oahu, of um, being stripped naked, of having a number written on his body in big, le in, you know, big numbers, in big digits, in red ink, and then the Trans-Pacific voyage from Hawaii to San Francisco, in which these men were crowded into five to seven men into a single cabin that was then locked shut with an armed guard in front of it. And these men were only allowed you know, to go to the bathroom even at scheduled times. So they were really treated uh, like prisoners of war, like criminals. Akira Otani volunteered for the Hawaii Territorial Guard, but soon the loyalty of the Nisei Guardsmen came into question. All of the Niseis or the second generation Japanese who had volunteered for this type of service were out the way or discharged from duty. There was a guy there, Hung Wai Ching. This guy, Hung Wai Ching, who was very friendly to the Japanese boys, said, what the hell are you guys are crying about? If they won't let you carry our, our arms, what the heck? You can do a lot of it. You can do pick and shovel work. In 1942, a small group of Nisei from the University of Hawaii formed the Varsity Victory Volunteers, a labor battalion for the war effort. The young Nisei wanted to prove their loyalty to America. The VVV led to the formation of the 100th Infantry Battalion and later the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. The government finally recognized and said, well, I think we can trust you guys. So they organized the 442 and permitted us. They permitted us to volunteer for the 442, which at which time I also volunteered for the 442. Nisei soldiers comprised the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. In 1943, President Roosevelt approved the creation of a segregated Japanese-American Army unit. 10,000 men from Hawaii volunteered. So all those who had served in the Triple V more or less placed in the front lines. The price was high to prove their loyalty to America, as the 100th and 442nd suffered heavy casualties in combat. The 442nd is still the highest decorated military unit for its size and length of service in the history of the U.S. military. Other Japanese Americans served in units like the Military Intelligence Service. Akira Otani was reassigned from the 442nd to serve in the MIS. While training at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, Akira Otani was able to visit his father in an incarceration center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I would sit 
at one side of the table and my father would be sitting at the other side of the table and there would be an armed guard standing right in between there. But I think I must have uh, complained or something. Here I am in the American army with a few stripes uh, the way it is over there, you know. And yet you people have to, have to put an armed guard there. What's the big reason for it? What's the sense of me having an American u soldier's uniform when you people? Are? So I think it's because of the complaint I made and thereafter there was no, no other uh, person interfering with our visit. Otani's three other sons served in World War II as well, while he remained incarcerated for the duration of the war. Koichi Iida's incarceration was just the beginning of many hardships for the family. Now, I was just about seventh grade. I would be called a Jap. And we didn't hear from him at all. And my mother was uh, worried. Where she worried and worried it. And then she became sick later that year in 1942. Uh, she wasn't getting any better, and then the, the family had pleaded with the War Department to send him home, but they denied. Her condition had worsened, and in 1943, uh, you see, she had died of cancer. I remember at that time, friends who came to the funeral had said that it was the really saddest funeral that here my father was interned, my mother was sick and and she died and you know she she was the one who protected us. In March of 1943, Sand Island closed and the Honouli Uli internment camp was opened. It was the largest confinement site in Hawaii and peaked at 300 civilian detainees and 4,000 prisoners of war from Italy. Japan, Okinawa, and Korea. The camp was located in a gulch northwest of Waipahu Town and was referred to as Jigokudani, or Hell Valley. Among the incarcerated were two territorial legislators, Sanji Abe and Thomas Sakakihara. Congresswoman Hanabusa's maternal grandfather, Muroda, was sent to Sand Island and then the Honouli Uli internment camp. He apparently ran the missile, and he would make sure that people uh, were fed. He would always, uh, when he started to talk about it, his favorite story was how he would trade bread for rice because there was an Italian camp here and a German camp here, and they liked bread. Japanese Americans were not the only ethnic group incarcerated in Hawaii during World War II. The Germans and Italians, or ethnic Germans and Italians, uh, were held at the same camps that the Japanese were. All of the uh, German and Italian internees were living on Oahu. Here in Hawaii, I found 139. That a lot of the folks who were interned as, as German or German-American were not actually ethnic German at all. I found people who were Irish, who were Norwegian. They were deemed close enough to German to be interned. There were also a handful of Japanese-American women incarcerated at Honu'uli'uli. Uli. From what I can tell, there were seven Japanese-American priestesses who were interned. Um, I'm not sure how many other Japanese-American women or Japanese women were interned at the time. And it does look like there was a separate barracks for um, some of the women. And again, based on the transcripts that I've read thus far, um, the women were always told specifically not to communicate with um, the men. August 14, 1945. Japan surrenders. World War II ends. Japanese Americans behind barbed wire begin to come home. The camps are gradually shut down. And my father came back in August of 1945. And that was uh, such a happy reunion. He had lost a lot of weight. Uh, and uh, it took some time. I, I don't know how much, but it, it took some time to get back to normal. In 1952, 
Matsujiro Otani went on to help found the United Fishing Agency, which is still the largest commercial fish auction in Hawaii. I don't think we discussed too much about, you know, the, it wasn't a pleasant topic. And then my father continued with the store. Koichi Iida went on to help found Central Pacific Bank in 1954. In the 1970s, groups of Japanese Americans organized a movement to seek redress from the federal government. In 1988, President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act. Former prisoners received a letter of apology from the president and $20,000 in compensation. However, many Issei had passed away by that time. As more time passed, the events of World War II began to fade into distant memory. But more recently, through the efforts of organizations like the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, a rediscovery of the past has begun. This included archaeological research of all the confinement sites throughout Hawaii, including seven known sites located on Oahu. Well, when we first came to Hawaii in 2006, there was some information about the different internment camps, and we knew some of the places. But in the last 10 years, a lot more information has come through about where people were held, and so that is what we wanted to investigate this trip. At the immigration station, we now have a map that dates to World War II. One building in the back of the main administration building is labeled detention building. And that two-story building fits the descriptions that, that you read, can read about in Ganbare of people walking upstairs and into a very big dark room where they didn't know who was there until daylight the next day. The Sand Island internment camp held hundreds of people. Very little of the original internment site remains. The area where the Japanese Americans were held, I believe, was the largest compound. And it has been paved over by the main Sand Island Parkway and some adjacent parking lots. But not too far away is the Sand Island Treatment Center, which still has a chapel that was built by Italian POWs. The public identified two sites in downtown Honolulu. One, the Yokohama Speed Bank, and the other was the Honolulu Police Station. They're right next to each other in a historic district. They're both beautiful buildings, and they were both used to, to intern at least a few individuals. Honolulu Uli is a difficult site to work because the vegetation can be very thick, like it seems to have been when we were doing the field classes there. So it seems important to keep on looking. I suspect there'll be many, many more features found than what we've documented so far. The Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii launched a grassroots movement and public awareness campaign to collect signatures urging President Obama to recognize Honolulu as a national monument and as a new unit in the National Park Service. A broad coalition from local, state, and national organizations, along with elected officials, came together to voice their support for the preservation of Honolulu. On February 19, 2015, President Barack Obama announced that Honolulu would become a national monument. So now with the great work of the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii and the Japanese American Citizens League and the cooperation and now donation of Monsanto Corporation and the University of Hawaii West Oahu who's providing access, we now have the ability for America's storyteller, the National Park Service, to tell the story of Honolulu Uli that was lost for so long. It's time for the shame to be gone. It's time for the blessings to be felt. And that's what this is all about. So as I get emotional, along with a few of you, 
It's because this story is so important and it's because the shame can be put to rest. My grandfathers did not speak about it, but it was until they were in the 80s that they actually spoke about any experience with the internment. I didn't even know Honouliuli existed as an internment camp until one day at dinner. Very few people know about what happened then. It should be told to a certain extent. People should know what happened. Our government made a mistake during World War II, but admitted that mistake and has admitted that it wasn't really for national security. It was based on racism. And we need to make sure we don't make that same mistake again. I feel a lot of disappointment and anger. Disappointment that we as a country could do that to our people, our citizens. Anger because we are coming so close to doing it again. And I just don't want to see that happen. You know, with the happenings right now, probably it could happen again. At the beginning of this year, with a new administration, an executive order, another executive order was signed with the same kind of mentality, a, a racist mentality with a broad brush characterized all people coming from six Muslim nations are potential terrorists. Clearly that's not true. The difference between 75 years ago and today is that the Attorney General of Hawaii, uh, Doug Chen, said this is wrong and he challenged it. And uh, a federal district judge of Hawaii, Derek Watson, put a stay on that. In November of 2017, the Hawaii Coalition for Civil Rights sent an open letter to President Trump urging him to visit the Honouliuli National Monument on Oahu. It was a reminder that government action for national security cannot come at the expense of depriving civil rights and that there are serious threats to democracy when people are judged on race, religion, or where they came from. We are living in very troubled times. Unless we tell this story, and unless people are willing to listen, we are not going to protect the future generations. Efforts are ongoing for more research and documentation. Untold stories of the people who endured this dark chapter of American history continue to be discovered. <laughs>